Hello, my name is Doris and I'm an art educator at the Art Gal of Ontario and it's such a pleasure to have you here, everyone, online world in particular. Uh, we are going to do a senior social talk and I want to now introduce you to two people. Voila, hello. Uh, with me today is Anna and Abigail. Anna, wave hello. And have a gale. Hello. Yay. All right. So here we are. And uh, actually, this is a kind of a unique talk today because all of a sudden I'm looking at the front of our AGO, this Frank Gehry, you know, build. And if you've been inside, I'm assuming both you and Anna, Abigail and Anna, you've been inside, right? So that, uh, yeah. yeah the uh, Galleria Italia, we call it. And it is ironically, what do you think? Very much like a canoe, uh, the inside of a whale. But regardless, there's some kind of nauticalness, I think, about this structure and this particular part of the AGO. So mm -hmm. that kind of, yeah, fits in nicely with our, our theme today. And uh, I do want to begin uh, with a land acknowledgement. The Art Gallery of Ontario operates on the land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confeder Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the federal government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit Anishinaabe Nation. Toronto has always been a trading center for First Nations. Uh, very important. So I'm actually gonna go back one moment. All right. Uh, so people know now, I'd like to start off with a couple of words. And uh, today the words are, uh, float or swim. And I'm going to say right away that for me, I'm not a strong swimmer. I'm not even a great floater. But the in this sort of topic of nauticalness uh, and these, these two words, float, swim, uh, I think it's important because imagine yourself like, you know, in a body of water, even if it's a swimming pool. And I don't know, you have to kind of imagine like, you know, how far can you swim? Do you need to float in between? Are you gonna have enough energy to come back? So Abigail, for you, float and swim, what do those words mean to you? Uh, well, like you, I'm not a strong swimmer, but I love to float. And one of the most uh, uh, relaxing things for me is to float on my back uh, so that I can just look up at the sky and just be surrounded by the blueness and watch the clouds go by and it's, it's just a just a lovely feeling to to be held up by the water and just lie there it's lovely thank you Abigail Anna how about you well, I like what I like what Abigail said. I agree. Float to me is a very peaceable concept. I actually am a very good swimmer, and a uh, very strong swimmer. I'm not I, I I'm not a distance swimmer, but I love being in the water. I feel very safe in the water, and to me, water is is the most being in water is the most relaxing, peaceful, tranquil experience possible. Um, I, I love being on the water. Whether I don't love pools, but we we love to be on canoe trips where you're just your, your, whole, your whole world is a water world. So to me, both floating and swimming are very positive, very positive, peaceful, energizing. Yeah. That's my life. I love water. <laughs> well, this is, I think, going to be the perfect talk for you then. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Yeah, let's, okay. Thank you so much for sharing already. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Abigail. I am going to now uh, attempt here. Yeah, Charles Finning. Right, Charles Binning. <laughs> and uh, the title of this piece is Ghost Ships. And uh, yeah, 1949. So Charles was uh, actually a lot of people called him uh, BC. So very interesting because 
you know, he was born in Alberta, but he, he lived in Vancouver. So a kind of, you know, little, you know, helpful hint is that, you know, he is, he was called BC and uh, as in BC Vining. Yeah. So kind of, yeah, he was age 40 when he painted this, by the way. So yeah, with those two words, um, all of a sudden, you know, maybe float and swim mean very different things when we look at this image. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, Abigail or Anna, how much you know about this particular artist, but um, yeah, if you wanna just jump in and, and speak to the, the painting, I could, uh, you know, follow up with a little info about him too. Well, I, I um, had, uh, I loved this painting as soon as I saw it. And uh, I, I think there's, uh, it's, it's very whimsical. Uh, what was interesting in reading a little bit about uh, BC, if I can call him that, um, is that uh, he was an architect, I think. That's his background. So uh, it, it was interesting to me, I think about architecture as something that's very structural. And, uh, um, and while this has structure to it, it, uh, it, it's whimsy. I, I mean, I could see it easily on the page of a children's book uh, about, uh, you know, being on the sea. And um, I, I love the sense that uh, although there's, there's no specific water anywhere, these things look like they are floating. Going back to your words. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Anna? Well, Thank that's you. very interesting. And, and and unlike Abigail and, and Doris, as you, you and I had talked about this, I'm coming to this completely cold as if I was walking around in the gallery and just spotted this on the wall. I actually don't know anything about it and I've never seen it before. And I don't know anything about Charles Binning except I have heard his name. So, so I'm just seeing this for the first time. Um, so it's a completely cold reaction or fresh reaction, spontaneous reaction. But I, I absolutely agree with you, Abigail. The word to me is, is um, jaunty. It has, a, it has a, playful, a, a playfulness to it, a jauntiness to it. It's a cheerful, it's a cheerful kind of depiction, even though it's called ghost ships. These aren't very scary ghosts. Um, there's something very precise about it though. And that probably, that maybe reflects the architecture training because it's very specific. I mean, those points on the bottom are, and they're balanced. It's believable that they would be able to stand up on their little keels the way they do. Mm -hmm. um, the rigging is so specific, the lines, like there's there's not much left to the imagination. They're very precise, but they're not precise in a prissy way. They're kind of fun. Um, he's having some fun with this. It's it's adorable. It's actually, it's really, it's, it's, it's very, it is very pleasing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, yeah, and it's interesting too that, you know, this is a lot less abstract than many of his other artworks, even his other uh, boat, you know, he was he was very attracted to being at the harbor in back in Vancouver, and uh, it was uh, probably partly a you know I mean, ships are kind of an, an architecture in themselves. So you know, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. you know been he was a he was a drawer to start with, and then he he was also actually to start with I would say he was an architect uh, as Abigail mentioned, and. Uh, uh, there is a kind of relationship to, to you know, ships and architecture. Um, and uh, yeah, he can get way more abstract with his ships than what we're seeing right here. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the wonderful thing about like close looking, and, and in fact, this is what we're kind of doing, right? We're spending a little bit of time with this. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm seeing like cracks in ice, but the ships are kind of uh, you know, sort of caught in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the ice in a way. So interesting. So mm -hmm. yeah, the longer we spend with these pieces, the more we might uh, see and, and give to it. And again, yeah, I think that the, the title Ghost Ships is, is very, um, uh, you know, curious. And as we know, we're going to be making artwork. And uh, Charles Binning started off his career doing more drawing than painting. And this is an oil on board, but uh, I think that uh, working on, I believe what we're going to do is work on sort of a darker paper with uh, light, you know, marker or crayon. Uh, and, uh, you know, all, I think right away that kind of gives it a kind of a ghostly uh, effect. Anyway, uh, if it's good with you two, I'm going to move on to our, our next artist because I want to do a big comparison here. 
uh, even though our focus will be on Charles Binning for our art making. However, Joyce Vielands, uh, are you, um, uh, if you're not familiar and, and you know, I'm not assuming anybody is out there, but uh, Joyce Vieland, a Canadian, uh, you know, paint, she was more than a painter. She was a filmmaker. She was, uh, she made uh, quilts, you know, she was famous for uh, a quilt she made uh, that was um, reason over passion. And that's what it said on her quilt. So here we are looking though at one of her, her paintings from a particular period in her life. Uh, she went to New York uh, and she went there with Michael Snow, uh, her husband at the time. And it was 1962, I believe that they were there until 66. And uh, she was pretty much doing filmmaking and uh, had this particular tragedy series. So here we are looking at, you know, a, a sailboat and indeed, look what happens. So again, I'm going to get back to those two words and uh, float or swim. Looking at this painting. Yeah, so in, in one sense, this painting is uh, lifting up the opposite of float. Uh, we've got sink, <laughs> so it could be sink or swim. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's interesting to look at this painting because uh, when you mention quilts, it does have that quilt-like look in, in the squares. Uh, it looks like it might have been pieced together. But there's also, again, something, um, although it says tragedy, so I don't want to go against that, that notion, it does remind me of those times when uh, children or young ch people, they do this thing where they kind of gradually go down and down and down and down to make it look like they're sinking down into something in a kind of a fun uh, way. Um, so, so in terms of her background as a filmmaker, it kind of looks like she's creating that slide by slide. Oh, absolutely. No, it looks like a, it's a, it's a storyboard. It, if you were, if yeah. you were doing a, if you were doing a film or, or a, anything, you would storyboard it like this. So here's what happens in each scene. So absolutely. It, it certainly does tell a story. I guess what we don't know is, is it, is it an okay story or a sad story? I mean, as you say, you know, kids going out and they're, their lasers and, and practicing how many times they can flip it. it. I mean, maybe it's that, maybe somebody's having some fun. It's hard to believe there's anything really sinister going on because of the, because of the, the prettiness of the colors. To me, it's hard to believe this is a dark story, but maybe it is, I guess it could be. Um, but it, it, it still seems like a ha it's, a, it's, it's positive. You've, it, to me, it's not, it's not threatening. So maybe I'm maybe I maybe there's a there's a story behind the story here that I'm not getting, uh, or that she she's trying to leave some questions. Are are the people swimming after this? I hope they're swimming. I hope they're good swimmers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or or you know here's here might be a thing that if we weren't uh, if we didn't know a little bit about you know her her you know painting period at that time uh, that she was depicting airplanes falling out of the sky and so on, uh, and we weren't given mm -hmm. that title. Like mm. if, if we just looked at it without the title, yeah. we might, yeah, we might be on the opposite side where it's like, yeah, sometimes when the waves and those waves can be joyful in the sense that you might want to, you know, swim into them and splash around and ride those waves. And, and yeah, in the distance, something might, might fade away depending on how close that wave is to you. So the title is maybe in this case, you know, telling us maybe too much in a way right? Instead of, if we didn't have the title, it would just be really open to a different kind of interpretation, whether it's like, yeah, that connection to, you know, uh, the squares sewn together or a film strip or whatever. So, so but fun. It, yeah. it, but it could be a mystery to it. Maybe it's like, you know, uh, Charles Gorey, you know, some bit bad things happening right in front of you. And it's meant to look kind of lighthearted, even though it's bad. It's hard to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that at the time she was um, disappointed with the United States um, because of, um, how can I say the, it was the, the war. Um, oh, help me out here. Um, I'm Vietnam. 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 Yeah, exactly. And all of a sudden she's, she was actually doing a, a film uh, to, to make aware, like a kind of empathy 
for the draft dodgers that were wanted to come to canada and they and 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 shortly after she she that was it you know she she left the united states and came back to canada and that's actually when she she started that whole quilting and the, the, her patriotic uh body of work very much about her her love of canada so sometimes being kind of far away makes you you know love home a little better yeah mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I feel like we could like talk and talk and talk. I wanted though, a next screen, I want to, uh, for us to look at the two uh, together. Um, and, and because, right, like it's an opportunity that we normally would not have in the uh, oops, gallery uh, to see these works side by side. The Joyce Wheeland uh, painting, uh, the last time I was at the gallery, it was, it was hanging, but the, um, uh, the Binning uh, painting has not been in the, the gallery. So here is something that's, uh, you know, from out of the archives, so something we can't normally see, besides mm -hmm. something we, you know, we, could, we could see if the gallery was able to be open. So uh, actually, I, I think I mentioned to you both, like maybe bringing a, a taste or sensory um yep. thing to this yeah visit and and i have with me i have um a cinnamon gum and uh yeah it actually smells pretty good <laughs> i won't start chewing my gum right now and i also have a uh, salt sea salt um so if you brought anything it'd be kind of fun to uh connect the the sort of the time of year i was thinking sort of like uh, cinnamon as being something very, you know, about land, being on land, uh, maybe on a boat, uh, and also about travel. For whatever reason, I think of like travel and cinnamon flavor and Valentine's for that matter, and the sea salt <laughs> just because it's like, oh, if you were out there and you gulped any of that water, if there, you know, that that in itself is a kind of tragedy, right? You think you, you think it's all water? You can't. No, salt water. So yeah, let me uh, tell me about what you have with you. So I brought uh, with me, I have um, a very delicious looking and so far uneaten scone. It's a blueberry cinnamon scone, which mm. I'm really looking forward to eating. And uh, yeah, like you, it's this delicious uh, sugary cinnamony smell. So um, that's that's really gonna be um, amazing to eat. But I, I was thinking uh, similarly of cinnamon as, um, as something that we can get because we're able to travel and, uh, and have cinnamon from other places in the world. And, uh, and there's obviously a whole history of the, the good and the bad of, of all that exchange of, of those kinds of goods. But certainly cinnamon is, is a, such a, a wonderful, rich flavor. And uh, I, I love it in, in any kind of, of baking. So I don't necessarily think of cinnamon as um, land-based. I immediately, it conjures up the idea of um, uh, ships on the water and, and in my mind, probably the old galleon ships when they first were starting to do that cinnamon spice trading um, uh, long ago. Um, Great connection. Great connection. <laughs> cool. I like. Um, so the other thing I have, which I got for Christmas, is uh, is this uh, little tiny jar of preserved lemon. Mm -hmm. I've never tried it before, and when I owned it at Christmas, I think I've uh, since put it in every dish that I've made uh, since Christmas. It is uh, lemon. If people don't know it, it's lemons that have been preserved in salt, and uh, so I thought it was going to be very, very briny, very salty, but it's actually this wonderful combination of the, of the lemon juice and the saltiness, but in such a lovely combination. And when you open up the jar, the aroma of salt and lemon is amazing. And then adding it into cooking, it, it just uh, adds a, a brightness, but also some umami tastes that are as I say, I, I think uh, my family will be glad when this little jar is used up <laughs> because, uh, and I was looking up recipes yesterday on how I can make my own um, uh, preserved lemon because it's just such a delicious flavor. But um, I was certainly um, thinking about it because uh, one of the aspects of, um, I mean, like you, Anna, I love water, but I think the water I love the most is the sea. And I think, um, 
for some reason, Charles Binning's piece reminds me of sea, whereas uh, Whelan's piece reminds me more of lake. I don't, I don't quite know why that I have that association. But I think for me, sea, it's not just being in the sea, which I love, but the smell, that, that lovely ozone brininess. So certainly when I open up the preserved lemon, <laughs> it takes me to that just very joyful place. So yeah, <laughs> so those are my two pieces. Oh, your preserved lemons sound great. You can, I've seen recipes for those too. I, now you've, you've, you've inspired me with your description of them. <laughs> now me, try it. Yeah. For, for me, cinnamon and I, my cinnamon today, it's not very exotic, but actually it's something I do love to do is just a coffee uh, with a cinnamon stick just dunked in it. And it sort of percolates and steeps and you get this wonderful sort of cinnamon layer to your coffee. But for me, cinnamon is synonymous with home. It's a homey spice. It's not an exotic spice to me. I, I, I love to cook. I love to, 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 um, to cook um, you know, curries and, and a, Asian food and, and, and the rest. And I love throwing cinnamon into those, but to me, it is primarily a homey thing that you have in you know, applesauce or apple pie or a cinnamon bun, which are home and safe and not very exotic. There's something cozy about them. So I don't associate cinnamon with, um, with going places. I, although technically I absolutely understand what, what Abigail was saying, totally makes sense. Cinnamon is indeed exotic. To me, it's homey. There's something really safe and, and familiar about it. It's a, it's a very familiar, regular kind of flavor and spice. Uh, salt on the other hand, is certainly looking at the, looking at the water, looking at the ocean, that yeah, that to me is certainly is certainly about salt and brine and the idea of being somewhere sort of wild. I love going. We love going down to Nova Scotia, and that salt smell is to me the most important aspect of recognizing we're somewhere exotic. We're not home. It's the it's the opposite of being home. That salty smell. So these two pictures to me don't look they don't look safe and familiar. They look like ocean. They look wild. Or at least the the um, the, the 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 Joyce Whelan certainly has to me it does say ocean and it does say wildness there's something about the precision of of the uh Charles Binning that I can't quite get to wild from that I'm I'm still working on that it... <laughs> thank you this was great uh so nice to uh talk with you Abigail and Anna and uh we will say goodbye to our audience now so all right, online Bye -bye. world. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. That was fun. Bye-bye. <laughs>